So, so, you know, trucking and logistics is typically a very antiquated business, right? People are uh, not very, uh, they don't like to change, right? right? How, how do you, when, when you're trying to make change and you're trying to kind of change the way people do things, how, how, do you, how do you guys go about doing that? Yeah, we are very aware that the user experience has to be just amazingly simple, easy to use, um, very intuitive. And so we spend a lot of time making sure that people can use our app and our solutions with no training whatsoever. Gotcha. Right. I think that's super important because even if you think about not just the, the trucking industry, but our vendors, like warehouses have a massive turnover. Yeah. Um, heavy truck repair and maintenance technicians also have a lot of turnover. And so the, we, we are aware that we always have new people using our product. And they're not probably going to be trained and not going to watch training videos and stuff like that. So they really need to be able to just have the app be very intuitive. And the way we do that is we do emulate consumer experiences that are going to be familiar. I mean, even if people aren't very digital, they're digital in some ways. Like right. my mom is on Facebook all the time. <laughs> right, right, right. I, you know, she can do anything on Facebook. Like she's a pro, um, but you know, she, <laughs> she can't download apps on her own phone. So right. like, you know, it's people, people figure out ways to be digital. Gotcha. And so we just have to understand where the customers are and make this to feel intuitive to them. So that's one way we address it. Okay. Um, and then you just have to solve a real problem, right? I mean, you're not going to go anywhere if you're not solving a real problem or if you're not sort of you don't feel natural in sort of the flow that they're in. And right. so we've thought about that too. Like we want to make sure that our product always works. So one of the examples there is um, we have a new product that we're helping, um, you know, helping with sort of issuance of payments. And we support, the driver can actually reach us for support through phone, through text, through a web form, through our app. Like we support all of those because we know it has to work for our customers for all drivers, anytime, anywhere. Right. And so if you've got a driver with a flip phone, they still need to be able to engage with our product. And so we think we have to design things like that, just being aware of how the industry works. That's great that you guys are thinking like that. Cause like you said, everybody's not as advanced. You know what I mean? That's right. So like there are still guys out there with flip phones. You'd be surprised how many drivers still have I know. Nokia slide flip phones. I mean, yeah. they're out there. <laughs> oh, they're, they're totally out there. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just an evolution and it's gonna for take sure. a while. And so. You know, but but our customers, our business customers, they don't they want to deal with multiple different platforms and products and solutions or have one off situations with their driver. They just want it to always work. And so no matter what we're doing and how, what we bring to market, we think about it that way because we just have to understand where people are in their, you know, technical journey. Right, and right, it's right. not all going to be 100 percent. I love in the app, yeah, right? I mean, it's not, that's, that's not the way the world works. Yeah, no, nah, I got you. Yeah. Let, let's talk about growing a business. You said when you when you first got started, you first took over, yep. you said you worked with a, a few uh, shippers, right? Like about four or five, what was it? Uh, customers? Four or five, we were actually on the vendor side. So vendor four, side, Like Sorry. warehouses and, and customers. So, yep. so you started with the warehouses and the customers. Yep. So talk about the journey. Where, you started there. Where did you guys kind of transition and move forward to? Just, just talk about how we built to get to where we're at today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, first of all, it's probably worth noting we're uh, we're a venture backed company. Um, I have raised just under forty million dollars for the the company uh, to date. Okay. Um, when I took it over, the company had not yet, re yet raised venture money, but it had a little bit of angel funding. Okay. Um, and and so my goal when I took it over was to sort of see like, did we have a monetizable product? that would be able to attract our first venture round. Mm. And so I focused the first four to five months of the business, really making sure that we were in a spot where we could raise our seed round. And so in early 2018, we raised two and a half million dollars. And that's really where we started to focus on um, product extensions into new segments, proving that it's not just warehouse customers that want this, but it's also heavy truck repair and towing customers. We also started to work on our sales process. So hiring our very first sales team, figuring out what the sales mechanics look like, right. um, which is different. Like this is not like selling a, you know, digital marketing solution to digital marketers it, where it could be all online and very hands off. Right. I mean, this is, this is the transportation industry. It's a lot People, of moving parts. And they do a lot on their phones. Yeah. That's like, if you want to reach someone, you're still best chance is going to be that you get them on the phone. Yeah. And that's not how venture back companies usually sell stuff. Right. I mean, it's usually 
paid search and just starting to think about online. And I think you can reach these customers online, but it's really, I mean, as you know, you're reaching people online. <laughs> Correct. But it's different. It's not, it's just, it's not like selling a typical enterprise software solution. Right. So we've spent a lot of time focusing on getting that right, putting our, our investment dollars there. And, um, you know, we raised our Series A in, in 2020. I closed on that and got the check, last check on that, like seven days before the world stopped with the pandemic. Oh, wow. Um, so felt very, very, very lucky. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> right? Just, For sure. Right? Because, I mean, the world stopped. I mean, you, we, we all lived it. So the world stopped for 60 to 90 days. And, like, I, it would have been very difficult to complete a fundraising round in that environment. Yeah. Um, and then we raised more money earlier this year to, to continue that, our growth. And it's really been about expanding product, expanding our product and engineering. We do almost all of our development onshore and um, continuing to build out our sales organization. Got you. Did you have a background in, in venture, like raise, raising money? I had never raised a single dollar in venture in my entire life. Um, yeah, no, that was like a huge experience, interesting experience for me. Can, can you talk about that? Like yeah. what, what made you even look to that as an option? Did you like know someone else or did someone introduce you to somebody? Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, so I was super lucky that I was in the incubator that I mentioned on Georgia Tech's campus. Okay. So they were good at sort of connecting people with sources of, of capital. Um, you know, Atlanta has probably um, a little less of fewer than 10 VCs that focus on the Atlanta market. Okay. Um, but I ended up raising all the money outside of Atlanta. Most of our money is from, is from Silicon Valley or, or New York. And, um, you know, I, I just talked to a lot of other entrepreneurs here in Atlanta who have successfully raised funds and just kind of learned how they went about it. And I learned that it was, um, it's a sales process, right? It's, I mean, and that's actually what I've learned about being a CEO in general. Is this <laughs> right. like all sales? You're all a salesperson. Time. I'm right. a salesperson. I tell people it's all, I sell our investors, right. I sell customers, I sell employees to right. come and work here. Right. Like, I am sales all day long. All day long. All day long. <laughs> and so once I conceived of the whole like investor thing as a sales process, it, it made it easier for me. Mm. Um, when I raised our seed round, I think I probably talked to a hundred different firms. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Same, same spiel over same and over again. Same spiel right? over and over again. So like, I just had locked myself in the room and just like <laughs> pitch after pitch after pitch, got right. the feedback. Um, and then over time you just have to change it. I mean, I used to have to do things like record myself to see how I'm, you know, coming across, get better at it. Yeah. Um, tweak the pitch, hear what the feedback is. Yeah. Um, and it's, it, it is, it's, I mean, it's just a sales process in gotcha. some ways. Um, but it was, I mean, it was interesting. It was hard. I mean, it's not, um, you know, you get a lot of no's. <laughs> you can't, you can get 95 no's or 96 no's right. and be like, I am like just killing it. I am awesome. Right. right. <laughs> you know, but you have to like keep on going. Yeah. And, um, and so and I, at some point learned to have fun with it Okay. and kind of be like, I'm going to just have really interesting conversations about my business with right. all these smart people who see lots of interesting other businesses. Right. And, have no expectation. It's kind of like dating, right? You know, you know, it's probably not going to work out, but you know, I get a free dinner out of it, so it's fine. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of positive affirmations, right? That's right. What, what, what are some of the the I guess like the KPIs or the the things that investors are looking for when when you try to raise money? What what are you yep. pitching to them? Yeah, I mean, part of it is like what is what? How are they thinking about the sector, right? And so you know, one of the things that I think is interesting right now is freight tech is white hot. I mean, just white hot 100%. right now. 100%. It's crazy how much money is going into freight tech. But when I was raising, end of 2017, people were like, I'm, trucking companies are never going to change. <laughs> They're never going to adopt anything. This industry is never going to change. Right. It's so hard to sell into. It's so fragmented. We don't understand it. Like, I would spend every pitch educating people on, here's how the market's structured and here's what a broker is and here's how, what an owner operator is. And you'd have to have like this educational conversation on every conversation right? Uh, and explain why the industry is the way it is. And, um, it, but that chain has changed just amazingly in the last six to 12 months. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and people are getting interested in more things. So I would say the first wave was sort of digital brokers, right? Like the convoys, the convoys yep. um, you know, Fast follower was sort of visibility. People like four kites and Project 44. So like, where's the freight? 
Um, another thing that started to get hot after that was sort of, you know, people who are doing e-commerce shipping solutions. So yeah. you see, we see a lot of activity there. Yeah. But right now, I mean, I'm seeing a lot in payments. I mean, there is a lot of stuff like we were one of the early ones, but there's a lot of activity in payments. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, activity in next gen TMS solutions. Um Drive creative ways to recruit drivers, retain drivers, almost create like a trucking company in a box yeah. sort of solution right, is right. really hot right now. Right. So it's been really interesting seeing how it evolves. And I think I got off topic because you had asked <laughs> no, me originally so like what investors were looking for. But I think the the interest in the sector has just come, uh, you know, just completely changed. Right. And, and so that's helped a lot, especially for the later rounds. Right. Um, in the early rounds, what people wanted to see is that you had something that people wanted, right? Did you have something that customers were excited about and they would rave about, that they would miss if it was gone? Were people willing to pay for it? Did you have an economic model that works? I mean, it, especially for like really, really early stuff, people are just looking for green shoots right. of there's some magic happening there that looks promising. And then they also have to just like you. Right. Like as a as a leader, I have to like your management team. They just have to like what you're bringing. They have to think that you're gritty and you're going to stick with it. Mm. I mean, the the startup journey is usually a story of the five times you almost died. Right. <laughs> and, <You're> right. <laughs> That's funny. And, I've heard that so much. Times. It's like it's like this uh, microwave type of, you know, pitch. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Right. And, and so it's just it, it, they have to know that you're going to just hang in there. <laughs> And, you know, the good news about me is I am, I'm a native West Virginian. I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. I had no idea. I've never seen anybody do the things that I'm doing today <laughs> right. as a child. Like, right. so this was never on my radar. And I just it was always too stubborn to quit. And so that, got, that took me out of the state, go, went to college outside the state doing all sorts of crazy jobs that I never expected I would do. I went, ended up going to Harvard Business School and I didn't think any of those things were possible. And so I think all of that, that upbringing and just, you know, just not knowing what my limits were or just right. not willing to acknowledge them has been helpful in the startup world. Awesome. And, yeah. and a great story as well. Yeah. Do, do you do you connect a lot with a, uh, with your peers in the freight tech space? I mean, are, are you guys yeah. are you guys networking? Are you guys sharing ideas? Tell me like how that works cuz obviously this is an ecosystem that we're creating for everybody, right? Yep. So how yep. do you guys go about building off of each other? Yeah, it really depends on sort of the segment, but I would say yes, for the most part, they are very we are helpful to one another, especially if we're not in competitive segments. Um, and the way that we share information is you should kind of share information about go-to-market strategies. Because again, I think we talked a little bit about this, like figuring out how to sell into this industry is, is pretty hard. And so that's a really great way to kind of share learnings with other people. Yeah. Um, we have a philosophy of um, partnering with anyone and everyone. Um, we actually partner with the incumbent fuel card and fleet check solutions. We're partnering with both Calm Data and with EFS, and we are, we want to be open. We kind of want to be sort of like Stripe or just connect right. a bunch of different other platforms into ours. So we're very open to it. Not everybody is, um, but I think <laughs> that there's so many legacy systems and also new emerging systems and ways that you could be partnering that having that mindset, especially in this industry, is helpful. And to your point, like you're building an, an ecosystem for the overall benefit of the transportation industry. So like. The more you're sharing, the yeah. better the outcome's going to be. A hundred percent. A large segment of our audience are owner operators, yep. right? They listen. If, if if you were to speak to them directly, could you kind of make them understand how uh, how RoadSync will will help them in their in their everyday lives, right? And just because mm -hmm. uh, obviously you have a solution, so just explain to them what was broken before, yeah, and, and how you guys are fixing it for them. Yeah, I, I would say for the typical driver or owner operator. Previously, if you were having to pay for anything outside of fuel, the merchant or vendor or service provider that you were engaging with made it really hard to pay and made it very hard to get a digital receipt so you could track your expenses. And so we make that easier for them to track their business expenses, to be able to submit those expenses on to another carrier or a broker and to really have visibility on all of the weird stuff that you have to do and you encounter when you have a load. And I mean, what's interesting is 
Um, every single load is a, basically a business trip. Right. Right. <laughs> right. And so right. if you were to go to any other industry, like I was a management consultant for a little while in my early 20s. And, you know, I, I had to track them all, all my receipts. I had a corporate card. I but I never worried, oh, does this airport accept uh, Amex or Visa so that I can have my flight paid for? Or, you know, can I pay for this, you know, now with a taxi cab with a credit card? But a driver actually could go someplace and not know how or not know how to pay right. for something right. or, or have to call somebody else to figure it out. Like, that's crazy. We would never sit through the airport and wait for our employer to call in a check to pay for our flight. Right. But that's sort of the experience that a driver has for a lot of these expenses that they confront on a regular basis. And it's just silly. Like it should, it's just, <laughs> it shouldn't silly. be that difficult. Yeah, right? it shouldn't be that difficult. It's silly. So, so we're, we're fixing that. And want, they should, it should be as easy for them as it is for any other professional. If you twisted, confused, or stuck about trucks, don't be dumb. This is the place to come. Truck and hustle. Let's go.